Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Today we're going to talk about two different things, network topologies and how data gets transmitted from one place to another. When we first started talking about networks, I told you there were two definitions for the word channel. The first one and the one that we have used so far is the path that a message follows between two communicating nodes. The other definition, the, the alternate definition, is a channel is one of several signals available on a broadband medium. And that's kind of a 25 cent definition. But if you think about television or radio channels, I don't know whether anyone listens to broadcast television or even broadcast radio anymore, but if you think about Sirius XM, all 700 channels are there all the time. Your radio picks out one of them. Okay, so you've got a really wide band of stuff with many channels in it, and you pick out one of them. So the alternate definition, one of several signals available on a broadband medium. So some more terms. A link is a segment of a communications channel, and there's a picture coming up if that isn't clear. Bandwidth is the bit rate of a link or of the overall channel. Now, usually it's only meaningful to talk about the bit rate of one link. And the link in a channel with the lowest bit rate is essentially, essentially defines the bit rate of the entire channel. We'll see that with the picture in a minute too. Bandwidth is also the theoretical amount of information that a link can carry. And it's also the range of frequencies passed by the medium. So different definitions for man bandwidth, but they all mean the same thing. The electrical engineering definition is the range of frequencies passed by the medium, but that is what determines how much data a link can carry. Medium, that's the thing that carries the signals, whether it's wire or unguided signals like broadcast signals, radio signals. Guided communications are limited to a specific path, so copper wire, fiber optic cable, those kinds of things. Unguided communications are not limited to a specific path, so radio and light waves not in a fiber optic cable are unguided. The characteristics of a channel include directionality, and we have, we've mentioned this before. Simplex messages go in one direction only. Half duplex messages can go in either direction, but only in one direction at a time. Police radios are like that. So if you see the police radio on, on the TV show, um, the officer says 10-4 over, and then the dispatcher can talk. Full duplex, simultaneous um, messages in both directions. Number of connections, uh, channel can be point to point or multi point. Digital or analog, we can carry either digital signals or analog signals. And the interfaces at the ends are part of a channel's characteristic. So we could have wired ethernet, wireless ethernet, Bluetooth, DSL, any one of a number of interfaces. Circuit switching, we mentioned this very early, one of the first things we said about data communications. In circuit switching, a channel is dedicated for the entire duration of the connection. A virtual circuit is a path that works kind of like that, sends packets between one end and another, the intermediate nodes might be shared. So it's not the same as circuit switched. Packet switching or datagram switching is the way the internet works. Packets are routed from node to node independently of one another. When we mentioned this the very first time, which seems like a long time ago now, I talked about messages in envelopes. Mail two envelopes from Atlanta to San Francisco they don't necessarily have to take the same route. 
Um, they won't necessarily arrive in the same order that you mailed them. That is packet switching. We talked about the OSI reference model and the TCP IP. We talked about the OSI and TCP IP reference models. These are the so-called protocol stacks with the different layers of the stack communicating with each other. And that means I can replace a layer in the stack with a different one and still have everything work. And I can use different protocols for the different aspects of communication. Where replacing a layer in, in the stack is most visible is when we replace the physical layer. Do something maybe with wired Ethernet and then do wireless Ethernet. We're still doing Ethernet, but where the physical connection in one case is a piece of wire and in the other case it's a radio signal. So why would we have communication models? We can separate the tasks that are necessary for communicating. It makes the design of protocols simpler. It permits modification or substitution. And I just gave you the example of wired or wireless ethernet and permits a system to select only the protocols I need. So topologies are the way a network is laid out. And in a minute, we're going to mention the idea of both a physical topology and a logical topology. There are five important ones, star, ring, partial mesh, mesh bus, and fully connected mesh. In a star topology, each station is connected to a central facility. So you can think of a, a switch in the middle and then spokes coming out. The switch in that central station connects pairs of nodes. It used to be that we could have a hub in that central station that connected everyone to everyone. Um, that is obsolescent. Nobody uses hubs anymore unless they're trying to do monitoring. That central node can broadcast information to all of the stations. And if that central station goes down, the whole network is down. So here is the diagram of a star local area network. Switched Ethernet is both physical and logical star topology, and the switch is, that, is the central node. In a ring, each station is connected to its upstream and downstream neighbors. Whoops, um, I got ahead of myself there. Um, token ring, which is mostly obsolescent now as well, is a ring topology. Notice that in a ring topology, there's no central switch. So there's no single point of failure. And if one link fails, everybody can still communicate with everybody else by going in the other direction. If I cut any one of those links, there are still connections between all the nodes. Can't cut two of them, but if I cut any one of them, there are still connections to all of the nodes. So I told you that there's a difference between the physical and the logical topology. Here are two diagrams. The physical topology shows the routers, switches, and the various other things. The logical topology just shows the connections. Here is something that is a physical star, but a logical ring. The ring is there in that central device, and each each node is connected to the ring. Now I do have a central point of failure, one point of failure. A hierarchical network is also called the backbone network. The idea is to keep local traffic local in large networks. And then we have a backbone that connects several local area networks. And that backbone also typically provides access to external networks. I've already said this, the chief motivation is to have local nodes talk to other local nodes. Communication between local area networks happens only when it's needed. And I can extend the range of a network beyond that of a single local area network. Um, everybody has probably noticed that there are limits to a, the length of an ethernet. 
and the limits have to do with the speed of light. Nanosecond is about this long, right? And we can't make the network longer than the reaction time of those network interface devices. So here's the picture of that. I have it on the right, upper right, I have a department server with a switch and some number of stations that all belong to that department and probably all talk mostly to each other. Notice there's a server in there. Another department with its own switch and some nodes. Another department in the lower left with a switch, some nodes, and a printer. And then there is this thing called the core switch. That is the one that, that can move traffic from one of those local networks to another. Enterprise storage is connected to the core switch. Everybody has access to enterprise storage. And the router that goes to the internet or other networks is connected to that core switch. So that is the hierarchical or backbone network. Okay, communications channel. In this case, we're talking about definition one of the channel, a, a link between two communicating nodes. Uh, and there it is. You saw this in the very first day that we talked about networks. Now, let us look. Here is maybe a typical home to internet connection. It may be a little old. I still have DSL at home, but I may be the only one left in the world. Home computer speaks Ethernet to a DSL gateway or a Starlink gateway. In the case of DSL, the connection between the gateway and the DSL access multiplexer is an analog connection. Then there's an analog connection. No, then there is a high-speed connection like SONNET, the synchronous optical network, or a synchronous transfer mode or something like that that connects to an internet backbone provider. And then another ethernet that connects back to the web server. So there's reading from the left, an ethernet link, an analog link, a SONNET link, and then another ethernet link. All of those comprise the channel between the home computer and the particular web server, whichever one it is. So a communication channel is characterized by the signaling method. How do we signal? And I gave you examples of, of copper wire or radio for ethernet. Bandwidth, how much data can I put through the channel per second? Directions, and we talked about simplex half duplex and full duplex, noise attenuation and distortion, and then time delay and time jitter. Okay, noise is interference. It comes from outside sources. And let me tell you something practical. If you are building an Ethernet network in a building, you're probably putting cables above the, the dropped ceiling. Fluorescent ballasts are the world's worst source of noise. Do not drape the wires across the fluorescent lights. Your network won't work. They need to be suspended up above there. Attenuation is loss of signal strength over distance. And if you think about it, I could stand here and shout as loudly as I'm capable and nobody out in the parking lot can hear me, right? There's walls and stuff that get in the way and attenuate the sound of my voice. Distortion is exactly what you think it is. Uh, the signal gets, the, the shape of the signal gets changed. Time delay is how long it takes the signal to get from point A to point B. And um, Grace Murray Hopper, who is one of my heroes, Admiral Hopper died 1998 or something, a long time ago anyway. She said she was approached by an ad admiral who wanted to know why did it take so dang long to transmit data by satellite. And Hopper said, there are a lot of nanoseconds between here and the satellite. Okay, that is latency. If I'm sending a message up to a satellite and then back down, 
there's a lot of nanoseconds between here and that satellite, right? And unless you're trying to play multi-person games, latency is not a big deal with data. Jitter is a big deal. That means that some packets take many, many, many nanoseconds and other packets take much less time. All right, now they're arriving out of order. And that's fixable, okay? Um, TCP IP has sequence numbers, so we can reassemble the packets back into the proper order. But if we have all but this one that's going up to the satellite and back down, now we have to wait for that one. So jitter, difference in latency, is kind of a big deal. Transmission method, analog signals a continuous range of values, discrete signaling, only a finite countable set of values. Digital signaling, is binary discrete signals, only two values, on or off, high or low, something like that. And we'll talk about modulation a little bit later. But you can see an analog waveform and a digital waveform on the slide. Um, the two waveforms do not represent the same thing. That is, we have an on, off, on, on, off, off, sort of in the digital waveform. The analog waveform is actually a note from a violin that has been displayed on an oscilloscope. Digital signals, binary discrete signals, um, preferred because they are less susceptible to noise, less susceptible to interference, and that means they're more reliable. I can do signaling by changing electrical voltage by changing electromagnetic radio waves or by changing light waves. Light is also an electromagnetic wave, but it's so much different from radio waves that we tend to think of it differently. Data get represented by changes in the signal as a function of time. And I wish I had made that in big, bold letters. Changes in the signal as a function of time. The signal is always the same. There's no information passing, right? We got a signal there, but there's no information. In order to pass information, the signal has to change as a function of time. Okay, on the wire, all of these changes are analog, and I'm going to show you, as soon as I finish scratching my mustache, I'm going to show you what that means. It's a terrible thing when your mustache has a wild hair. If this is a, a picture of an oscilloscope, it's actually an oscilloscope implemented on a, on a personal computer, the red line represents a digital waveform with a transition from zero to one. And that red line says this happens instantaneously. In real life, it does not happen instantaneously. Even though this is a digital signal on or off, there is a non-zero rise time. You can see that in the blue line. And then there's some time where we're settling into that on state. That settling is called ringing. And we, we build our circuits to ignore that. Uh, basically, basically, we'd put a cutoff about in the middle and say if it's below the cutoff, it's a zero. And if it's above the cutoff, it's a one. But on the wire or on the radio wave, all of these signals are analog, even though they're representing digital data. The sine wave is something that happens in nature in a lot of places, and it is the basic unit of analog transmission. Amplitude of a sine wave or of anything else, any other um, repetitive signal, is the height of the wave or the power of the wave. Frequency is repetitions per second, and it's expressed in hertz, abbreviated HZ. Strictly speaking, hertz is 1 over time, but non-strictly speaking, it's easier to think of it as repetitions of that sine wave every second. Okay? So, the period of a sine wave is how long it takes 
for one complete cycle. The wavelength is the distance in space. So if you tie a rope to a post or a tree or something and give it a shake, you can put standing sine waves on that rope and actually make something that looks like the picture that's on the slide. The wavelength is the distance spanned by the sine wave. And the implication of the wavelength has to do with both the frequency and the transmission medium. Okay, in this case, the transmission medium is a rope and the wavelength is going to be longer, I think, than if the transmission medium were radio waves. Frequency cycles per second, number of times the sine wave is repeated, and the unit of bandwidth is the hertz, one cycle per second, really one over time. So, sine wave frequency, one over time, how many times does the sine wave repeat in one second? So we have zero over there at the left edge and one second at the right edge, and we can count the repetitions and figure out the frequency. If we're talking about fiber optic cable, lambda, the Greek letter that looks like an upside down Y, is the abbreviation that's used for wavelength of light. Lambda, the wavelength of the sine wave, is the speed of light divided by the frequency, just like the slide says. If you put a piece of chalk on the edge of a bicycle wheel and arrange to roll it along a wall so that the chalk was touching the wall, it would describe a sine wave up, down, up, down, up, down, as the chalk goes around the wheel. Do you all believe that? If you think about it for a minute, you will. And that means we can talk about the phase angle of a sine wave. And we can talk about that phase angle in degrees. So if our bicycle wheel is at zero degrees and we turn it so the chalk is at the top, that's 90 degrees. Another half turn is 180 degrees. Now the chalk moves down to 270. And finally at 360, we're really back to zero. So we can talk about the phase angle of a sine wave. And here is an example of that. If I have a reference waveform, and I have to have something to serve as a reference. The middle is phase shifted 90 degrees. The, the bottom trough of the middle sine wave is at the same time point as the upper part of the second cycle of the reference waveform. And if I phase shift it 180 degrees, I am ex essentially halfway around. All right, now, this is something to believe rather than something to prove. If we were doing electrical engineering, we'd prove it. All waveforms can be approximated as the sum of sine waves of different frequencies. So I can add sine waves of different frequencies and get some other waveform. Spectrum, the frequencies that make up a signal, bandwidth, range of frequencies, and there is something called filtering that lets us control the bandwidth. That is how your Sirius XM receiver works. It's controlling the bandwidth of the signal that you receive. It's also how radio receivers and television receivers pick one channel out of all the channels out there in the air. Sound waves about from about 20 hertz to about 20,000 hertz. Stereo systems actually do reproduce about 20 hertz to about 20,000 hertz. It turns out that 40 hertz to about 4,000 hertz is enough to recognize people's voices. The, the large percentage of the frequencies in, in the spoken in, in voice are between 40 and 4,000 hertz. Radio waves from about 60 hertz, which is 
the same as the frequency that comes out of the wall socket to about 300 gigahertz. AM radio up to about 16, um, 1.6 megahertz, and each radio station is allotted 20,000 hertz of bandwidth. FM radio got 100,000 hertz of bandwidth from 88 megahertz up to 188, um, to 108 megahertz. Television 54 to 700 megahertz with about 4.5 megahertz of bandwidth because now we have to carry not only sound we have to carry picture information and color information cell phones 800 megahertz to 5.2 gigahertz and more than 5.2 gigahertz now that we're getting into the version 5 stuff visible light in terahertz but usually we express the frequency of a light wave as wavelength so about 380 to about 750 nanometers. Um, those, are all, those are all things that you look up. But you're going to have to know how we're going to use them. There's, there's only one thing I have told you to memorize in this whole course, and that was a list of a few important values of, of binary numbers. And you didn't do it. A sine wave, one sine wave, a single pure tone. So that middle A is 440 hertz. If I'm going to transmit data, I have to modulate one of the characters. That is, I have to change it. Um, the characteristics of a sine wave are amplitude, frequency, and phase. So AM radio, we modulate the amplitude of the signal. The demodulator recovers the original signal. So if I'm modulating digital signals, I've got two possible values, zero and one, three techniques, and this stuff you do need to know. I can modulate amplitude, frequency, or phase. Two possibilities with amplitude modulation, also called amplitude shift keying. I represent data by holding the frequency constant and varying the amplitude. Frequency modulation, I hold the amplitude constant and vary the frequency. In phase modulation, I vary the phase with an instantaneous shift or switching between signals of two different phases. So here's a picture of that. If I have a transition from zero to one, with amplitude modulation, the amplitude of the, of the signal increases. With frequency modulation, the frequency of the signal changes. It's increasing on the slide, but it could decrease. The key here is that the frequency changes. In phase modulation, I'm gonna change the phase of that carrier sine wave. So amplitude modulation, frequency modulation, and phase or phase shift modulation. I can modulate more than one property and therefore maybe jam more than one bit into one signal event. So the word baud is one signal event per second. If I'm only modulating one property, baud corresponds to bit rate. If I'm doing only amplitude modulation, only frequency modulation, or only phase shift modulation, baud and bit rate are the same. But I can modulate more than one of amplitude, frequency, and phase. For example, quadrature amplitude modulation does amplitude modulation and also frequency modulation. And with QAM16, I can send four bits with one signal event. This is very cool. Okay, an ideal channel has a signal, takes a signal in at one end, it looks like a pipe, and it comes out the other end after a delay proportional to the length. Remember, the nanosecond is about this long. And so there will be a delay for a channel of any significant length. In real life, it is not that pretty. 
we get noise, we get attenuation, that's loss of signal strength. The signal gets weaker and we get distortion. So I, a channel really has two wires necessarily and the parallel lines represent capacitance. There is a capacitative connection between the A and B wires. There's also a capacitative connection between each of them and ground. The sawtooth symbol represents resistance, and there's resistance in each of the two paths, and the squiggle there, that represents a coil or inductance. Do we get into the electrical engineering of any of that? No. But we do recognize that a real channel is very different from the ideal channel that is just a pipe. Attenuation is loss of signal strength. It's a decrease in amplitude. And it's a function of the transmission medium and also of the length of the channel. Okay? If I, say, wanted to use a beam of light from a flashlight and send Morse code by pressing the button, um, I, can, I can do that from here to the door perfectly. I can do that over a fairly long line of sight. If I get around the curvature of the Earth, well, it's disappeared. But I'm going to lose, unless it's a really bright flashlight, I'm going to lose that signal before I have to worry about the curvature of the Earth. The light won't travel that far. It will attenuate. Sound attenuates even more quickly. Okay, amplifiers can restore the signal strength, but they also amplify noise, which is bad. Um, we talk about, when we talk about a transmission channel, we talk about the signal to noise ratio, the strength of the signal in relation to the strength of the noise measured at the receiving end. And I gotta have enough signal to be able to differentiate the signal from the noise. And the, the faster I'm trying to send data, the more difficult it becomes to separate signal and noise. Signals are subject to both to noise attenuation and distortion. Digital signal quality is less effective than analog signal quality because generally there's only two levels. A repeater can exactly recreate the signal. And so we use repeaters, not amplifiers, when we're transmitting data over long distance. And there is a diagram there at the bottom. I have a, a waveform that is distorted. It has some noise on it. It is attenuated, um, particularly there in, at, the, at the right end of the waveform. The repeater turns it back into a perfect square wave. I can send more than one signal across a transmission medium, and that's called multiplexing. In time division multiplexing, I'm going to divide, I'm going to divide the transmission time into time slots. And tele, T1 telephone, the, the mechanism that transmits telephone signals between central offices, it uses time division multiplexing. 24 time slots, a piece of a signal, a piece of another one, a piece of another, and 24 times, and then it repeats again. I can do frequency division multiplexing. Each signal occupies a different frequency band. Broadcast radio, frequency division multiplexing. All the radio channels are there all the time, and your radio receiver has to pick one out. Broadcast TV is the same thing, right? Satellite radio, same thing. All the channels are there all the time. Your receiver has to pick one of them out. The optical form of frequency division multiplexing is called wave division multiplexing or lambda division multiplexing. Now, what's important to you students of IT about this is when somebody is trying to sell you some optical gear and they talk about lambda division multiplexing, it would be good if you knew what that meant, huh? 
Otherwise, you could become baffled. And it, it is, do we have anybody in here who works in sales? Sometimes it is the goal of the salesperson to baffle you. The digital subscriber line now becoming obsolete, there are better ways to do it. Your home computer talks to the DSL gateway over ethernet. The DSL gateway modifies the signal and there are three bands. So DSL really is broadband in the sense that there are three different signals. There is a voice band, an upstream data band, and a downstream data band. And all of those go to a DSL access multiplexer, which breaks out the signal. The downstream band is wider than the upstream band. And the reason for that, the reason that it is asymmetric, is usually what you're doing at home is web browsing. So you send a fairly short packet of data that says, get me CNN's homepage. And then CNN sends a whole bunch of data back in your direction. If you are operating in the mode where the flow of data is toward your device, this makes perfect sense. If you are me and you are trying to upload the giant video recording of this class, this inhales forcefully, okay, because I don't have very much upstream bandwidth. Okay, bandwidth, bandwidth, bandwidth. The definition is the range of frequencies passed by the medium, whatever the medium is, wires, radio, whatever, with minimal attenuation. I can get one or more digital signals, modulated sine waves, different frequencies, but if they are all within the bandwidth of the medium, then I can send all of those, all of those different digital signals over the same transmission medium. And anybody have cable TV at home? There's not, not much cable left anymore. But if you had cable TV, you would have a coaxial cable that connected to the back of your television set, and all of the channels would be there all the time. And the tuner in your television set would filter out just the one that you wanted to watch. Higher frequencies, I can get higher data rates. Media with wider bandwidth can give me higher data rates because wider bandwidth means higher frequencies. And when we talk about data, data rates, we're talking about bits per second, usually. So broadband has been misused to mean speed, but let's look at a simplified definition. First, baseband, only one signal, like a voice telephone line, okay? Uh, could be very fast signal, gigabit ethernet is baseband. There's only one signal on that wire. Broadband, I can have two or more independent signals, like channels on cable TV. I've already said this, broadband is misused to mean fast, even when there's only one signal. A stricter definition would be that broadband requires a modulated carrier, and so implies frequency division multiplexing. In the strictest sense, Time division multiplexing, that's the telephone T1 channel, is baseband because there's only one signal stream. An electrical engineer will tell you that the baseband signal starts at zero hertz and goes up to some maximum frequency and there's only one of it. Um, baseband because the frequency, the, that one frequency occupies the whole base all the way up to zero hertz, and there can only be one such signal. Broadband, the electrical engineer will tell you that a broadband signal has minimum and maximum frequencies, and I can have any combination or combinations within those minimum and maximum frequencies. Can't have two signals of the same frequency, but if I have, say, a one megahertz frequency band, I can have a bunch of 20 kilohertz signals in there. 
more than one signal as possible on the medium. That's the real deal about broadband. Okay. The distinction between baseband and broadband has nothing to do with speed. It has nothing to do with the transmission medium. It has nothing to do with the direction of transmission. It has nothing to do with the underlying data, whether they're digital or analog. The only difference is, do I have one signal or more than one signal? One signal, baseband, more than one signal, broadband. Now, now that you know all of that, people will still misuse broadband to mean fast. The faster a signal changes, the more difficult it is to synchronize transmitter and receiver. And if you think about it for just a minute, transmitter and receiver have to be synchronized or we will lose data or garble our data. In asynchronous transmission, there are start and stop signals. And there we get a small number of bits and then a stop, a small number of bits and a stop. Low speed modems, ethernet frames can work that way. In synchronous transmission, there is a continuous digital signal and we have to worry about how we're going to keep it synchronized. Synchronous transmission depends on transitions between zero and one to maintain timing. So let me say that again. I have to have a certain number of zero to one transitions in order for the receiving station to maintain synchronous timing with the transmitting station. Okay. If I have a long string of zeros or a long string of ones, there are no transitions, right? Long string of zeros, just lots of nothing for a long period of time. And that means that the receiver's clock can drift from the transmitter's clock. We're talking about um, millions or billions of, of bits per second here. So a little bit of drift is going to get a bit into the wrong package. If a bit is missed or it gets sampled twice, everything afterwards is wrong. Big, big deal, big problem. Okay, in order to prevent reception errors, synchronous transmission needs an encoding method that ensures that there are some minimum number of transitions for each unit of time. 100 megabit ethernet encodes one extra bit for every four bits to be sure there is at least one bit transmission in every five bits on the wire. So 4B, 5B encoding. But we're going to make sure that there is at least one transition every five bits. And we have a 20% overload overhead for that, 25% overhead for that. Higher speeds mean even, even different encoding mechanisms. And your book, tells you about Manchester encoding. If you care about how such a different encoding mechanism might work, you might read the book about Manchester coding. You won't find it on the exams. Okay, transmission medium. How do we get a signal from one place to another? Physical properties, signaling methods, bandwidth, and sensitivity. Also, we consider whether we have bounded media, that is wires or fiber optic cables, or unguided or unbounded media that is radio, light waves that are not in fiber optic cable, and so on. So electrical media, we need two wires to complete a circuit, a wire to carry the data and a return. When we talk about wired media, sometimes we, sometimes we just say wire. It's inexpensive. It's easy to use. The signals get carried as changing electrical voltage or changing electrical current. Usually it's voltage. The most common data communication cable for local transmission is the twisted pair cable. Copper wire in pairs twisted together. If you look at the diagram, 
the different colored pairs have different amounts of twist per foot. That minimizes the interference from one pair to another. And um, you have heard about categories of twisted pair cable with category five and category six being the common ones now. A category five cable will have more twists per inch than say a phone cable because the twisting uses more copper but makes the cable less susceptible to noise and interference. Okay, so we use twisted pair in local networks and in phone lines. It is more susceptible to noise than coaxial cable, which we'll talk about in a minute. And we use it for short distances and slow signals. By short distances, I'm talking about, say, within one building. This is a pretty big building, but we can get away with using twisted pair cable in it. Coaxial cable is copper wire that's in the center there, surrounded by insulation, and then the insulation is surrounded by a copper mesh shield, and then there's an outer insulation jacket. So the signal travels on that inner copper wire. The, the mesh provides the return path that's necessary, but also shields that, uh, that inner conductor from noise. High bandwidth, 100 megabits per second or more. Analog cable TV runs on fiber on coaxial cable with frequency division multiplexing. We get dozens of channels at six megahertz of bandwidth each. It's called coaxial because all of those things fall, follow one axis. If you were to look directly at the end of the cable, which the diagram doesn't let you do, you would see that inner conductor and then concentric around it, the, the insulating member, and then concentric around that, the copper mesh, and concentric around that, the outside in insulation. All of those share the same axis through the middle. Coaxial cable, um, high-speed circuits. Fiber optic cable, glass fiber, it's thinner than a human hair, and so it's somewhat flexible, okay? You don't want to a fiber optic cable around a 90 degree turn with the radius of a 25 cent piece. It will, that will not work, um, but it is flexible to a degree. There is cladding around that core that provides for internal reflection. So the light travels along the cable rather than escaping from it. Then coating a strength member that uh, does exactly what you think a strength, strength, that's hard to say, strength member should do. And finally, an outer jacket. We use light to carry signals. The light's generated either with a laser or a lighting, light emitting diode. Light waves, high frequencies, terahertz, remember, although we usually talk about nanometer wavelengths. Because we have high frequencies, we can get high bandwidth and very fast signaling, fast data. Less susceptible to interference. As you can see, there are, are three layers, coating, strength member, and then outer jacket around the cladding and the core. So light is not going to penetrate into the core and cause interference. It's also difficult, although not impossible, to tap into a fiber optic cable. It's lighter than copper cable. It is difficult for multi-point connections. Um, I can do point to point, but multi-point I have to do some repeaters or something. So that's wires and fiber optic. Um, electromagnetic waves, microwaves, frequencies below light but above one gigahertz. So your normal home Wi-Fi, 2.5 gigahertz. So it's microwave, although it's not directed microwave, it's broadcast. Turns out to be the same frequency as your microwave oven. 
Now, I think I've said this in this class before. If your microwave oven is interfering with your Wi-Fi, get rid of the oven because it's leaking radiation. Okay? Your microwave oven should not interfere with your Wi-Fi. All right. Unguided radio waves can still be tightly focused. Uh, microwaves highly susceptible to interference. Um, rain, trees, anything that gets in the way. We use microwaves for large-scale internet backbone channels. You'll see microwave dishes on the on antenna towers around and about. Satellite to home radio and TV, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, microwave ovens. But does anybody have any questions about that stuff?